On the podcast today, we're going to speak about how tradition and traditional knowledge is becoming a thing of the past due to inevitable progress and continual progress, actually, in the world, which has kind of happened, especially since the Industrial Revolution. Um, And to kickstart that, we have a great quote from Aldous Huxley, where Aldous talks about the Hundun passage of the Zhuangzi text, the Great Taoist text, but he talks about the apocalyptic religion of inevitable progress. So mm-hmm. this is what we're going to speak about today. So it's very important for all of you to listen right through to the end. So Huxley states in the Perennial Philosophy, one of the best books you'll probably ever read, as I mentioned, he is talking about the Hundun passage here. So in this delicately comic parable, chaos, Hundun, is nature in the state of uwe, non-assertion or equilibrium. Shu and Hu are the living images of those busy persons who thought they would improve on nature by turning dry prairies into wheat fields and produce deserts, who proudly proclaimed the conquest of the air and then discovered that they had defeated civilization, who chopped down vast forests to provide the newsprint demanded by that universal literacy which was to make the world safe for intelligence and democracy and got wholesale erosion, pulp magazines, and the organs of fascist, communist, capitalist, and nationalist propaganda. In brief, Shu and Hu are devotees of the apocalyptic religion of inevitable progress, and their creed is that the kingdom of heaven is outside you and in the future. Zhuangzi, on the other hand, like all good Taoists, has no desire to bully nature into subserving ill-considered temporal ends, at variance with the final end of men as formulated in the perennial philosophy. His wish is to work with nature so as to produce material and social conditions in which individuals may realize Tao on every level from the psychological up to the spiritual. So this is one of the best quotes by Huxley, Mm -hmm. and especially in the perennial philosophy, but it's got a great point. And again, the apocalyptic religion of inevitable progress. So we kind of think in the modern day that inevitable progress is a good thing, right? Like we think that all of the technological advancement, you know, the elimination of all of this cultural knowledge that we've accumulated for thousands of years is is a good thing. Like just eliminating and and really in two centuries basically right like yes um i think yeah it's speeded up since the time of um industrial revolution yeah but also we could say um also it's been even even sped up even more since the dawn of uh smartphone devices yes Yes. The, yeah, with the um, social media's dawn of social media's right. Mm. That's the around the time when we could carry internet on our in our in the pocket, mm. right? Mm. So uh, that started to dictate our way of thinking, di- dictate um, our, our decision making in our life in general. So that uh, kind of a huge invasion by. Um, Technology. Yeah. Mm. You're basically controlled by an algorithm. Yes. Your life is dependent and controlled by an algorithm. That's that's got nothing to do with you. Mm. And actually runs counter to tradition. Yeah. And and the traditions that we've all... The reason why we got to the point of technology and even the Industrial Revolution was built on tradition. Yeah. But because we came across all this, then we are eliminating things skill sets and knowledge that have been beneficial for us for you know who god knows how long you know and so now it's not to say that it's either good or bad but huxley makes a good point saying that it in some sense it is a an, an apocalyptic religion because there's only going to be one end to this yeah you know and you and i were speaking briefly before the podcast We've never had this mindset, this Taoist and Buddhist and Hindu mindset of moderation, of understanding when enough is enough. Mm. But we, we, not, no one is living in that psychology anymore. They're all just like, I need more. 
Like give me, and technology in some sense has become the new religion. Yes. And you and I get a lot of pushback when we when we speak negatively about technology, and, my, and especially because of my upcoming book next year, a lot of people, you know, they start to defend technology as if it's a real person <laughs> or as if it is a religion. But it's it's dead. It's just a tool. Yeah. It's like defending a toaster or a or a pot, like yeah. a pot you you cook dal in. Like, don't say anything bad about my pot. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like it's a bit ridiculous, right? Yeah, pot uh, in a sense is a, a, a result of adma- advancement of uh, technology mm-hmm. as well, right? Mm. Again, uh, this idea of um, yeah tradition versus inevitable progress came up uh, about <laughs> when we were watching this beautiful uh, series of documentary filmed by this uh, Indian uh, individual. India in motion. India in motion. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the channel is yeah. Um, yeah, so he when he made a trip up to uh, very north of uh, India around uh, the uh, so the state of Ladakh. Mm. Yeah, so there is a very small like it's not even a town; it's a small village, maybe a community yeah. called um, Zanska. And there is also I don't know if you remember; I forgot the, where the uh, Tibetan monks live. Pukta Monastery. Pukta Monastery. Yeah, yeah, that's it. So where the young monks and the elderly monks live, mm. and obviously, being right on the Himalayan um, mountain ranges, it gets in the winter time. It's very, very hot. Summertime still gets hot. Uh, st- sorry, st- very cold. I cold, should say. Yeah. 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 Winter time gets very, very cold, and even in the summertime. Is called it during the night and then the early morning and mm. times like that. Um, and obviously, the Indian that road system up to mountain ranges is not very good, so it's a very limited supplies they could get from the big cities, right? Even electricity was um, settled in pretty recent years, right? Yep. And even the way they cook and just the way of their living is completely um, like a traditional and very down to earth, very natural way of living. And they cook things. Again, even we can go and buy anything that we want in the supermarket, and that's you just pick and choose whatever you want, yeah. right? Yeah. But those people in those small villages, they uh, pick their rice or wheat or whatever and, and they grind it with their stone grinder and mm. make it into a powder and that's how they make their food and cook in the wood fire mm. it's very traditional way everything by hand and manual but then there is a, a thing that happened in Zanska that recently that the water pump came into the place mm. So that things uh, became easier for village people to get the water. Water access is obviously is very important. Mm. But then it kind of came up to my mind that could be very beginning of this idea of progress. Yeah. Because once that they taste that convenience of this, what machine can offer them, yeah. then they'll get to. Uh, start thinking other things, mm. right? Oh, uh, this I find cooking on the on the wood fire is not very uh, convenient. Mm. What's the easier way to do it? So, people we start thinking in that way, so that then machines and this um yeah these things comes into their lives, yeah. and that is uh, again beginning of could be beginning of this um. Uh, very industrial re- revolution, I thought. Yes. Whereas, for me personally, I thought that way uh, make a journey to get the water of the river nearby, whether it's cold, it's not cold. Again, like me saying this is coming from outside perspective, so I could say this, but that itself had a like a cultural. Uh, lifestyle within that um, process of going to get water, fetch water, or looking for a firewood, dry firewood on the forest yes. and things like that. That itself kind of be uh, was a big part of um, an old way of living, mm. and that is the culture of yeah. the traditional way of living. So that that itself has to be, I think, preserved in some sense because that's. 
us saying we are living in nature in mm. nature's way mm. instead of bringing all sorts of technologies to make our life much easier mm. and th- and then then the journey to fetch go to and get water and then look for the firewood that part of culture kind of gets eliminated mm. from their lifestyle so that slowly slowly in that way the cultural uh, characteristics get lost in time yeah it's true and even in that series like when they're talking about Zanskar they they were making new roads in that remember mm. like so it's going to be easier to get food for them um, the use of tractors is going to be introduced for farming for the men and like you said like it's paradoxical because we, you and I are speaking about it as sort of out, outsiders and everyone listening is probably listen, listening as outsiders as well because we're all probably from being raised with tractors and water pumps and everything like that. So we can say from where we sit that it's convenient, but then when we look at their lifestyle and the traditional knowledge that, like you said, which is harmonious with nature, yeah. then there's a beauty to that that somehow should be preserved. Or in Huxley's case, it should be that, that should be the way we should be living because he was a product also of the Industrial Revolution as well, right? So he, he understood the damage that this idea of an, the apocalyptic religion has on the world. And so it's paradoxical because you think, oh, well, of course we want the women and men in Ladakh to, you know, have the same sort of com- comforts that we may have in, you know, the modern West, right, in, in air quotes. And so, but they lose something in that. And there was actually a, a documentary a while back. It's called Ancient Futures. I don't know if you remember it, but it was about it was about Ladakh, and it was about progress coming to Lay. And mm. when they when they started to open the roads up to get up into Lay, Lay is the for those who don't know is, a, is the capital of Ladakh. And so then that brought a lot of businesses. But this but this documentary was was talking about how traditional farming and and, and traditional knowledge was was being lost. And so. Uh, obviously, well, in Ladakh, that they they try to they well, they obviously do stick to the 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 ancient Buddhist uh, knowledge up in those areas because Ladakh is is very different from if if you go from Ladakh to to Delhi, for example, they're two different worlds, right? Mm-hmm. Like Ladakh is much more uh, much more of so, sort of like a Tibetan traditional mm-hmm. culture as opposed to Hindu. So, but opening it up opens up all of this new vista of like technology of progress and air quotes and as you know as huxley alludes to that even though we are making our life more comfortable and stepping away from traditional knowledge and skill sets and so forth and so on we are destroying nature in the, in, in the same time it's, it's paradoxical right like because our comforts and our convenience has been ramped up and it's all well and good right but as I mentioned earlier, we haven't found this kind of middle ground, and, and it doesn't seem like we want to find a middle ground because we're we're so possessed with moving forward. Yeah, and we see this in Korea, right? Korea is a good example of a country that yeah. has really taken inevitable progress on lock stock, right? Like so, you see, the traditional culture of Korea has disappeared because Koreans in general are very practical people and will do what's best. You know, for themselves and the community, yeah. and you can't blame yeah. you can't blame them because yeah. that's just the way it is. But then they've completely lost their identity, their cultural identity. I yeah. mean, because you know they're the most advanced technological country in the world. Yeah. You know, yeah. Yeah. Um, I think human species is very versatile. Mm. Since uh, human species, the Homo sapiens is very cultural animals mm. and uh, we have this uh, s- a set of knowledge over the millions of years that we got that got passed down to um generation to generation that the, and we are here today mm. right mm. but in saying that i don't think we the humanity t- of today is mature enough to ex, uh, to be introduced to this all this uh, advanced technology because um, the way things evolve 
and the way things is speed up mm. in technology, technological industry, it seems to be a little bit too quick, yeah. too quick for all of us to catch up. Mm. But the thing is, like you mentioned before, that we think this is a good thing. Mm. And again, that is a good thing under a condition where we can see what's enough and when to stop, mm. right? Mm. But it doesn't seem like that we are mature enough to call the shot, basically. <laughs> yeah. We are just, even we are in a, in a way the versatile in that way that we are trying to uh, catch up with the speed of technology as well, which is completely against nature. Mm. And we are nature as well. Mm -hmm. So that it, which is against actually human nature. Mm. That's why, again, like you said before, there's only one way out, one way, one end to this. Yeah. We know what that is. Yeah, of course, yeah. It's not very uh, bright future, no. unfortunately. Unfortunately. Yeah. That's a great point because it, we are the only species in the world, let's say, that has applied some, a fast forward button to them, mm. to their existence. So we're then completely out of sync with everything else. So just from a couple of hundred years ago, or even as you, to your point, m more present with, technology, uh, with digital technology, is we're trying to fast forward our evolution, so to speak, but it's not a natural process. So thousands and hundreds of thousands of years of all of this progress uh, naturally you know like with a with accumulative set of knowledge like cultural knowledge which is, which is accumulative then we get to a point where we discover electricity and then um then we have the industrial you know the industrial i mean the industrial revolution electricity and, and, and all of this and the machines, machines to produce yeah, things faster and yeah. more then yeah. phones and computers and yeah and then so and within a couple hundred years so you just like hit the fast forward button to see let's it's almost like a great experiment it's like let's see how these chimpanzees will deal with this <laughs> it's like, and then and you know it's interesting because you know and, and again like we always get a lot of pushback from people who defend digital technology for, for for whatever reason but if you just look at the world from the year 2000 so we had, we had computers and you know the internet was cute at that time right like i, I didn't even have an email address at in the year 2000 didn't, i didn't even have internet didn't know what really it was but then you fast forward to 2021, it's only 21 years. And if you look at the psychology of humanity in, 20, in 2000, as opposed to 2021, vastly different. And like, it's almost like there's a, almost like an embedded psychosis in the society now. And it's not because that we are naturally mad, it's because we have added this unnatural machine, this device to the minds of mil billions of people and they've gone, they've gone bonkers, you know, like, so like you see the eradication of common sense, you see uh, all sorts of uh, mind pathogens that are created to, from people who are, uh, are obviously affected by this psychosis that affects other people. And then you see a lot of violence and a lot of division and this and that, and the algorithm drives the, the, the violence and the division, but most people are not conscious enough to say, wait up, what contribution is the internet having to my perspective of the world? Yes. So, and I know you, we are speaking on the internet now, and I know someone's probably already angry and trolling and saying, but you're on the internet, we know that. We are not silly, we already know that. Mm. But how much are you being influenced by the internet? Yes. Mm. How much are your decisions informed by the internet? Just, just 21 years ago, you didn't have, you didn't have large scale access to that, and you, you still had critical thinking skills. You could still think for yourself and make your own decisions based on your own view of the world. But now your view of the world is multifaceted and colored by all sorts of different perspectives because of the internet. Yes. It's not natural. Since you mentioned um, 21 years difference between, yeah, since, since 2000 and today, but I was also thinking that like difference between, so before 2000 and 1980, for example. <laughs> 1980 to 2000, of course, there is a gen generational mm. gap. Mm. But is that gap no. uh, as big as between 2000 and 2021? No. So that is to show, it tells a lot yeah. to us that last 20 years, it's been overwhelmingly 
fast forwarded yep. our our life yep. became yep. Like. so yeah 1980 to 2000 would be, would be like still again way of thinking could be changed in this and that but as you mentioned i don't think there would be much of a like a psychotic psychosis um uh, symptoms of people pretty common yeah i don't think no it wasn't it wasn't very different mm, no. but now it is from yeah 2000 it's way different you look at it like even if you look at the media organizations the governments they are affected by this technology right the the algorithm drives the media and governments for profit yeah I mean, they just they fall in line with the algorithm because it means profit for them. So news organizations and this and that don't have to be transparent and give you the honest truth. They have a view that uh, is influenced by the algorithm. So the algorithm, the AI, is running the show, yeah. not actually the media organization. So that's why you do see, uh, you know, media organizations like CNN and these organizations that spread of misinformation yeah i mean and they openly do it and they're not you know nothing happens because of it because you know again like in some sense the government are in cahoots with the with the media and so forth and so on so and so you see this psychosis within even those spec those spheres right and but as to your point if you went from 1980 media and government to 2000 media and government not so much difference, yeah. you know. Mm. Maybe a little bit. No, there is. There but, must be a difference, but, but not, not like not night and day. Yeah. Not to the point where openly media organisations spread fake news. Yeah. Now and 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 openly people know about it. Yeah, you know what I mean. Like, so I even have friends in China who speak about even in China fake news, and you know, we're talking about China, obviously, so that's a no-brainer. But they know about it. Yeah. It's common knowledge now. So, but it's not, you know, and there would have been an element of fake news that would have been spread back in the day, but it wasn't influenced to the extent that it is now, especially not because, you know, because of the algorithm and so forth. So, what's really dangerous about it is that when we speak about violence, violence as in like um, shooting or killing someone, it's kind of external violence, we usually think, right? Mm -hmm. Like, mm -hmm. But what this whole social media algorithm drives to is to be violent within our mind. Mm -hmm. And they are actually for it. Mm -hmm. All these um, movements and interesting ideas between genders or uh, mm -hmm. race and this and that. Mm -hmm. and uh, Driven by the algorithm. Driven by algorithm. And that algorithm is driving separation and division between people mm. within the doesn't matter what race what country you're from it's just a humanity in general mm. and that itself is violence yeah. actually yeah. and it's been for if it's been going on for a very long time i think mm. it, what last let's say five years yeah particularly yeah, yeah particularly yes mm. And why I, I think it's a long time is the amount of information that's been spread is just too much out there. Like You don't know what's true and what's not, and you don't know what to believe and what not to believe. Mm -hmm. And nevertheless, the whole premise of social media nowadays is to just divide people into pieces. Yeah. Yeah. And that act itself is violence to me. Yeah. And that's what I see is very dangerous. Yeah, it's morally reprehensible what, what they're doing, the media and the, and the algorithm are doing, social media and, and everything. And governments, you know, they are manipulated by the algorithm and, and this way of thinking too. So then you have to really think, what are the intentions of companies like Google and that? Because it seems, and, you know, this is a no-brainer. And people, obviously, if you're not, if you don't have any good critical thinking skills and you don't notice this, but divide and conquer, this idea of divide and conquer is good for the bottom line of companies and because yeah. it keeps people in fear, it keeps people as consumers and it keeps us in a negativity bias where we, you know, people for whatever reason, look at YouTube, right? The, the, the most popular content on YouTube is drama content. Everyone knows that. I mean, if you and I had a podcast where we were talking about like sensitive topics we would have millions of subscribers. It's just, it's a no-brainer. Mm. 
and we would get rich off the back of that, and so would YouTube. They know the game. So you, if you fall into line for all of these stupid ideas of differentiation between races and genders and so forth and so, nations and that, then you're being played. You you are being played. Hundred percent. Hundred percent being played. And you and I come from the Eastern philosophical school and the the mindset of Judy Krishnamurti, where if you believe you are a race or a gender or a nation or a religion, and you wholeheartedly believe that at the expense of humanity, at the then you are being violent. It's an act of violence because separation itself is violence because in saying you are this or that, you are separating yourself from the rest of mankind. Yes. And the fact of the matter is we are one and even beyond that, we are also the one consciousness to take it even a step further. So it's almost like what's happening now is like a, is like a social IQ test. If you, if you fall for the tricks that the algorithm and the media and this and that are playing, if you fall, if you fall for this illusion of separation, that's, it's almost like they're, they're, they're sniffing out the least among us in some sense. Yeah. But the least among us are usually the ones who are driving the media and the governments, as Terence McKenna once said, right? Like yeah. we are often uh, ruled by the least among us. And obviously if you are, you know, I don't know how people in Google and this and that sleep at night because, you know, and we know people who are, who, who work for these sorts of companies and they openly know that when they have meetings and this, they, they often express that when they have these sorts of meetings, it's openly talked about, about how to like, what sort of angle we should go with and, and so forth and so on. This is a, it's a marketing ploy and always divide and conquer is always the best ploy. And again, if you're always falling for this, you're just being played, man. You're being played. And, and, the, and the funny thing is, is most people in the world, let's say 99.999% of the people in the world are innocent. And so they fall victim to this because what, what they see is what they get. That's what they think. Yes. You know, but what you see is not what you get. Mm. What you see is there's a lot more to it. Mm. You are being manipulated yes. to think a certain way, yes. to keep society a certain way. Yeah. And that keeps them in, in a position of power mm. and you at the bottom. That's what it's always been about. Yeah. So the harmony of humanity... And the oneness of life and, and the one consciousness that we are is never spoke about at large a lot outside of Eastern philosophy. And so, and you know, in, in understanding that, then we, then we would have a society that would um, try to live in harmony with nature and with each other because we're all the same thing, you know. Sure, there are different traditional sets of knowledge and cultural knowledges, and when I'm talking about culture here, I'm talking about language and, and religions yeah. and this and that. Yeah, most original culture to the land. To the yeah. land, yeah. Mm. So like, you know, if you go from uh, Korea to Japan, for example, there's two different cultures, yes. but they're not so far apart. Yeah. People say, oh, but they, they look the same. It's like, that's not what it is. It's, you're associating everything then with race, which is stupid. It's, it's, mm. it's cultural programming. Mm which is what sets people apart. Mm. But then what we've realized in the last few hundred years is you can actually bridge those gaps very easily because mm. it's only really language that gets in the way of understanding other people. Yes. But deep down, we're all the same. We all have the same you know, emotions. We all have the same uh, way of explaining things, but just in different languages. Yes. You know. Human uh, human beings are all the same, but lang differences of languages and difference between the generation to generations yep. and the degree of adva advancement of science and this and that. It's just a little details. Yeah, of course, yeah. Just a little details of human life, and that's all there is. Mm -hmm. But through thousands of years, human beings always been s the same. The uh, like clear proof is that all this wisdom that we have, mm. like from Gautama the Buddha, mm. the same. Uh, his knowledge is still passing down on. It'll, uh, it'll be here forever. And so as uh, Zhuang Tzu's uh, philosophy, Lao Tzu's philosophy, yeah. uh, in, in he, Vedic philosophy, Shankara, yeah. the same. That is a clear proof that human beings all think the same. Mm. We are the, the same. doesn't matter 10,000 years ago or 10,000 yeah. years from now on. Yeah. It's, yeah, we are the same, same creature. So that this traditionalism 
is our root in a sense mm. to keep our nature sane. Yeah. Right. Yeah, of course. I remember when I was younger and I read like Rene Gunon and um, Ananda Kumar Swami and these, you know, very difficult scholars to read. And I used to wonder why they used to speak about traditionalism a lot, like, and why they were proponents of traditionalism. I, I do know now why they are because it, you know, what we're speaking about, and I'm a bit older than when I read those books. And so uh, that knowledge is there because it, it has worked for thousands and thousands and thousands of years. And so in this generation, this one generation, we're going to eliminate all of that and assume that they were all wrong and we were right because of technology. So we are really just the servants of technology mm. in, this, in this modern day. We're not servants of, of God. We're servants of technology. Technology is, is the world's God now. So there will be mythology written about this in the future where the smartphone will be looked at as like a... a, a a version of God because it's a whole new different world that is it's different than the material sphere. And so we, we are eradicating all knowledge in in one generation. Yeah. Like we spoke about from 2000, 2021. Yeah. Imagine from 2021 to 2040 what's going to happen if we don't slow down. Yes. If we don't mm. slow down. Again, when's enough enough? Like, okay, you, you can get food very – you can access food easily – you can, you know, you can watch us on the podcast very easily. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like simple things, right? Yeah. But when is enough enough? Like, do we need to go to Mars? Do we need to do this? Do we need to do that? Because that's all built on the premise that we're going to outlive this planet, which, again, gives credit, credence to what Huxley said with saying it's an apocalyptic religion because that mindset itself is of the opinion that we're going to outsource this world. Then further technology will get us out of this. Well, that's, the opi- that's the opinion, right? Going so instead of, instead of knowing yourself yeah. and understanding the situation, we just keep, we keep the same mindset of inevitable progress and just keep going from, we'll just go from planet to planet and just keep destroying it. Yeah. Where we have a perfect planet here. We don't need to go to Mars and populate the planet. We have a perfect planet, breathable if, air, all access of food. If we, yeah, okay, let's say we're done with this planet. Mm. It's very sad to imagine, but let's say that happened. Mm. And then we had landed to Mars or anywhere else or mm. moon or mm. wherever. Do you think that we're going to start thinking differently? <laughs> Then yeah, no, no, of no, course, course not. Yeah. Another Earth's gonna re rebirth again, you, reborn again. Yeah, reborn again. Yeah, yeah. it's yeah. it's yeah. That that idea is is uh, that's not the right. It probably won't work anyway because I probably get to Mars and I realize that's ah, too much work. It's not comfortable enough. Uh, it's too big. <laughs> it's too hard. Too, hot, yeah, too yeah. many things. Let's go to... back to Earth and just ride this one out. <laughs> <laughs> so. But the thing is that, like, that, see, what we're saying is in that one generation, we're, we're eradicating all traditional knowledge. I know it's, hap- it's been slowly happening for a couple hundred years, um, but we're seeing it also with the spiritual knowledge, right? Like, so the, it, it affects the psychology of people as well. So you could say, in some sense, New Age spirituality is a byproduct of inevitable progress. So. And, and Alan Watts warned about this back in the 60s, right? Like he was saying how New Age is basically the over-sensationalization of Eastern philosophy. And everyone sort of thought like, what the hell is Alan talking about in the 60s? And then you get to the 80s and the 90s and we start to see a clearer picture of what Alan's talking about because then we see like all wacky sort of versions of yoga and, and funny understandings of Buddhism in the West and you know, so forth and so on, right? So you have this inevitable progress mindset saying that, you know what, this tradition, it's good, but I think that I can improve upon it. And it's like, but this has been built... Improve upon it. Yeah. Mm. This has been built for thousands of years. Who, who are you to, th- to think yeah. that you can improve upon it? You are nobody. This has come from masters' lineages going back thousands of years that were much more attuned than what you are. You're a victim of inevitable progress, the apocalyptic religion. And you think 
that you're going to improve upon this. That this is the see big problem with that psychology is that, and we see this not just within the spiritual tradition, but with people in general in the modern day, is that they don't accept things for as they are. Mm. You know, so I get this a lot on the channel, as you know, through the comments where uh, you and I teach the traditions of the knowledge, and then when that sort of makes people new ages feel uncomfortable, they say that's not Taoism to me, and it's like. Doesn't happen to you, maybe not, but that's that's, Jia Taoism. That's, doesn't matter, doesn't like matter what you think. What you think, yeah. yeah, doesn't matter what you think. That's what Taoism is. It might not be Taoism to you, but that means that you just practice a, a wayward version of, of what Taoism is, yeah, or a, something a, completely different, a fantasy, really. Yeah, so they the traditional knowledge, especially the spiritual knowledge, are perfect as they are. And they've, that's why they've benefited so many people, as you mentioned, Gautama and the Buddha, for thousands of years. And then we get to this day and age, and then we think that we can improve upon it and make it better to adapt to our modern sensibilities. Mm-hmm. So, our, see, our modern sensibilities are what are important. The traditions aren't. And that's where it gets dangerous. Yeah, well, then uh, they're just going to stop next generation to have the original knowledge of its own right yep they will all get to learn this completely warped and manipulated version of uh, traditional knowledge which is not traditional anymore no which will be um very sad it's just new age new age knowledge yeah. and mm. it's just knowledge that's been sort of you know re- recalibrated through a modern lens mm. to suit modern sensibilities as mm-hmm. i mentioned and then that's going to influence sadly uh, like you said, future generations who are going to think then, oh, you know, yoga is just asana, or they're going to think that Dao- Taoism is just, uh, you go with the flow, dude. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, so, like, all of these really wayward concepts with no grounding in traditional knowledge. And as you and I know, because we've learned traditional knowledge, the benefits from it, you know, and, and most of the people obviously listening and watching us you know know those benefits too right they wouldn't watch our podcast otherwise so you know and they they are they are perfect technologies as they are yes you know yeah this uh, traditional knowledge is um i think showing us how to uh, use our ability to think which is mind mm. wisely mm. i think but this inevitable and never-ending progress is to also use our mind, but in a completely the opposite way, mm. quite the opposite way. So that it's kind of once, uh, if anyone is introduced to this ancient knowledge, we have somewhat, we hold somewhat a responsibility mm. to um, understand and learn the traditional knowledge in a traditional way for our future generation so that we at least can um, teach people and next generation that how to use our mind wisely instead of falling into this um, inevitable progress yeah. that's only going to play against us, yeah. really. Mm. Well, we're digging our own grave, right? Like yeah. That's the whole concept of it. And it, and it could be metaphorical too, digging our own grave. We're digging our own grave in a sense psychologically, mm. you know, as we mentioned with the world going mad in, in 20, 21 years, you know, yeah. in, in that short period of time. And so we're almost digging our grave psychologically because yeah, we're driving ourselves further and further apart because of technology. And it's really strange. And, it, and like we, we've mentioned many times, we, it's almost like we weren't mature enough to have technology, mm. especially not smartphones and this and that, because instantly, and a lot, if you see something online, right, and you don't personally agree with it, but then you feel that you should react and tell them how to think, you're already not mature enough yeah. to have exactly. social media. Exactly. Because... You're not accepting that there, there, are, there are differences between different cultures and different ways of thinking. And there's always been that. Yeah. And so what's happened is that we've brought all these different ways of thinking into this little stupid phone that you can see at any moment. And so 
if you are one of those people who like get agitated and react and comment and and feel like you need to tell them how it is you are already not intelligent enough to have a smartphone and not intelligent enough to be on the internet in general so they can't handle it they can't handle it yeah basically so the, the beauty of humanity because of it because of our intelligence is that we sh- we used to be able to listen to differences of opinions and not even debate we used to be like oh yeah whatever you know what i mean like we used to we used to be more in some sense like the the japanese w- mindset of friendship always first yeah regard irregardless of your beliefs mm. and it, it was always friendship first there's so opinions and differences in thinking wise it was never that important <gasps> in old days and people always get along because everyone again everyone is the same we eat we take poo every day same thing Mm. so that the way we think differently you could care less about it no so that's the thing like and and that's what part of like a lot of the the older far eastern asian and south and southeast asian mindsets were was that always friendship first because of the fact that our similarities far outweigh the differences (laughs) <laughs> yes they far away a lot of people make a song and dance like oh yeah but you think differently but you're only you, you're looking just at the way of thinking but how about the amount of similarities that we have how come you don't look at that how come you're looking at one thing and you're triggered by this one thing yeah. that you know yeah for example like we we teach eastern philosophy on the podcast we don't teach western philosophy it's not that i dislike western philosophy i i've enjoyed studying that in my life but i don't personally resonate with western philosophy yes i personally resonate with eastern philosophy because i see the benefits of it Mm. and that's why i write about it and we do and we do this channel you know so i don't have like any hate for it like i mean it's see the the thing is that people in this day and age associate that if you have a difference you hate (laughs) <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, it's it's a strange way of thinking. Like. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think now I'm thinking, since you're mentioning all these things, this um, immaturity is also could be the outcome of a cult, the industrial revolution, I think. Mm-hmm. Because the idea of we can always alter the way of nature mm-hmm. to benefit our lifestyle is to also to cover our fear as well. Yeah. And uh, the way machines been uh, doing being so kind to all of us we have all this um, convenience we have cars i don't know we have um, motorbikes now we have like e-bikes and we have all sorts of things uh, we don't have to um, take pool outside somewhere backyard which is separate from the house it's all in built all little things like that giving us so much um convenience in our life so that we became really soft and soft and cushy mm-hmm. right so that even us thinking like uh, going to somewhere on holiday or something, if the, the bathroom is somewhere outside and the weather is cold and then it's not flushing toilet, it's, you know, like it's dogged up um, a toilet, it's, it's a squatting <laughs> toilet, and these are instantly, oh, sh- oh I think, oh, nah, let's, let's find somewhere else. This is going to be the instant uh, reaction, mm. right? So... That's just a small part of it, so that this uh, like continual progress of machines and things like that just only made us um, more fearful about just real life, I think. Mm-hmm. It's just how it was yeah. in old days. That's how we lived, how our ancestors lived. It's nothing that we need to be afraid of or feel uh, un- uncomfortable about it. Mm. And that's just th- that's how it was. And you know what? The world was not threatened with that way. That's exactly right. That's why back in those days, people were one afraid. Mm. They weren't afraid of anything. They had to. They they had to live pretty tough life, mm. and um, yeah, they had to go out and hunt and I don't know, fight mm. yeah. and these yeah, everything things. Everything was within within the spectrum of nature, wasn't it? Exactly, and that was uh, that was the culture. That was uh, the way of living back in the day. Yeah. And now this the machines and like yeah, again they've been too too generous and very yeah. very kind to all of us in the humanity. Yeah. So that now we 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 got everything. We yeah. like pretty much like even homeless people they get fed well. Mm. Right? Mm. But yeah, they don't have a home. 
I mean, which is not good, but it's not, they're not like dying in a extreme poverty in some parts of India, for example. Those mm. people who are really desperately need help. Yeah, of course, yeah. So, yeah, I think these uh, industrial revolution only got us to be where we are really too got too soft. Yeah. It's not yeah, we're not we're not invincible anymore. I like how you mentioned the, the sanitation. Yeah. Because I remember Sadhguru once said he said because someone said to him like about Indus Valley, right? So the Indus in in the Indus civilization, so like the, the ancient Vedics, they had sanitation and this and that. But Sadhguru kinda of laughed and he said, You guys always measure the development of a society based on where uh. we where we take a cra- <laughs> hell and where we take a crap. It's kind of strange, isn't it? Because like that's something that it, you don't even really need to consider, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so we measure our success by our sanitation. It's like what? What sort of like not not by like the knowledge we know or not by like the depth of of kindness and this and that. Just a, it's all about where we take a crap. I think that's how weak we got. Yeah, I yeah, think. yeah, yeah. That's how that's how sad it is yeah. actually. How that's how soft and weak and yeah. spoiled we are, really. Yeah. Like you know, like so we think we're all good with our porcelain toilets and all this and that. But like back in the day, like you said, we would go outside. We we take a poo outside. You know, the only danger is you might step on your grandma's poo. <laughs> it's yeah. going to be quite a scene, but you know. Oh, the thing. It happens. Yeah, it happens. If you, you know what yeah. I mean. <laughs> so things go wrong sometimes. Things go wrong. Well, and we learn. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So. Yeah. But like, it's just interesting the way that we measure inevitable progress. Like, and it's always based on comfortability, and turning us into really a species that has no skill set. You know, and that's one of the important things about traditional knowledge is that. Y- the, the tradition, the accumulative set of knowledge is has a lot of skills and you learn these skills, farming skills, yes. uh, how to chant a certain mantra, you know, weaving, mm. many beautiful sets of skills and they're all eliminated yes. within this, the few hundred years of inevitable progress. And like we've mentioned earlier, like obviously it's paradoxical because you want people to have comfort and convenience but where is the line? Mm. You know, where do we draw the line here? Like, yeah, again, that's uh, where this maturity needs to step in. Mm. We've been mm. talking about, and I'm, yeah, I'm, a, <laughs> I'm very skeptical about, about that maturity. But again, mm. only each individual uh, needs to make difference to make a bigger difference in yeah. society. And uh, yeah, we need to. It, I think it's now it's kind of skill to how to um, prevent yourself from this um, mm. online demons. Let's yeah, say yeah, yeah, this yeah. demonic world. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it just again, it's pretty simple in a sense. They just keep the distance. Mm. Yeah. If you can get rid of all smartphone or mm. smartphone-like devices, mm. and just have no social media account. Mm. Except YouTube. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, yeah, so all that sort of thing, uh, you just need to keep uh, a clear head about it. You need to have an ob- objective idea on um, this subject matter, I think. You're like you, you don't have social media, right? So that's, yeah. a, that's a good thing. Like, mm. and, and if you are a critical thinking person, then you need to understand, or you probably do understand, that all of the public hysteria and the stuff that you see online it's all driven by the algorithm. Yeah. And it's actually, that's not what people are really like. They're just being manipulated to think certain ways. And, and so meet the media, the government, uh, a driving separation and, a, and a, so kind of pushing us more towards a totalitarian yeah. society because of this you know, fake separation that the algorithm is, is producing. And it's interesting, and you know, again, how much freedoms we've lost—not just in the last two years, but even in the last twenty years—because yeah. of social, uh, because of the internet, right? Like a lot of things have come in, and are constantly our freedoms are being taken away, and people aren't really noticing. Mm. And it's all being driven by the, the the big tech companies, and 
exactly. the, the media organizations and governments that fall prey to an algorithm. That, that is not real. It's AI. Yeah. So, yeah. so we have to fall back in line with uh, traditional knowledge. And so what we're doing on this podcast is trying to our, do our best in uh, speaking about the traditional knowledge, um, speaking about the way of nature, you know. I wanted to just add, it just came to me before about when you were talking about Sadhguru mentioned about the sanitation of toilet mm. and this mm. and that. I think that idea also comes from that we think that our uh, feces is, is something dirty and something like that we shouldn't um, be too close by, right, mm. this idea. But again, just... It's part of part of human life. Yeah. Is to embrace it, and that mm. is that was the traditional way of living. So yeah. instead of um, being too much of an advocate of um, Western toilet, mm. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> just uh, just embrace that uh, some yucky part of a human nature as well. It's mm. just all nature. Yeah, mm. but you know, human feces is fertilizer for something else. Oh, hundred percent. You know what I mean? Like exactly. we don't think about it in that way. It's like yeah. that 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 talk that that comedy skit that George Carlin did way back in the day where he was talking about human body, actually. Mm. And he was saying, what a waste that the human body just gets buried. He's, <laughs> like, he's like, mince that shit up and, and you know, use it for fertilizer. Yeah. And so, same in the Buddhist and the, the Bond tradition in Tibet, right? Like, they have sky burials. Sky burials, for those of you don't don't know, is someone, there's a shaman who actually cuts the human body up and they leave it out for the vultures and that. And so the idea is that, you know, the vultures get nourished off that meat. The meat and, you know, and so their spirit flies out into other yep. creatures. And, yep. you know, so it's a beautiful thing yep. where we think it's a, a yucky thing in the modern day because yeah. we do everything in a very sanitized way where we put someone in a box and you bury them there and it gives you a place to go to to, to grieve and so forth and so on. That has its own thing. But again, that's kind of. That's so finite. That's yeah, so finite. Yeah. And, and it's, you know, again, like traditional knowledge in some senses is scoffed at through the lens of inevitable progress. So, and that's the point. So I guess that in conclusion, like what we're trying to get at is, is a, a point of moderation where we can live somewhat intelligently with technology yeah. and not lose our minds, right? Yes. 100%. And that's the point of my, my upcoming book. So, yeah. Guys, we hope you enjoyed the podcast and we'll see you guys next time.